A dream that doesn't end when you wake up. Sometimes you're able to muster the hope that one day it will. Two, standing in front of a plate glass window that extends endlessly in every direction. On one side of the glass is you, on the other side is everything else. You press your hands against the glass harder and harder. Three, imagine trying to explain the concept of air to a fish. Every day you are surrounded by fish. Four, one day a meteor comes hurtling out of the sky and hits your village. Every house is destroyed except for yours. You look out across the smoldering countryside and see your neighbors tearfully huddled around a pile of ash which just moments before had been their home and everything they loved in the world. Standing in the doorway of your intact house, you think, maybe now they'll understand how I feel. You hate yourself for thinking this, and you hate yourself for hating yourself. Five, a fly stuck in your ear canal. Eventually you forget it's there and the buzzing of the fly's wings becomes the sound of the whole world. People don't understand why you can't hear them when they speak. Six, none of these explanations are good enough. The first time I thought of killing myself, I was walking across Waterloo Bridge in London on my way to school. The thought only lasted a few seconds. I peeked over the side of the bridge into the lazy gray water 120 feet below, and for an instant I saw myself falling. It's not that I wanted to jump necessarily, but only the realization that I could. Moments like, the, moments like these I've learned are common among depressed people. These are moments of profound self-possession, moments when you begin to understand your terrible freedom, as one person I talked to called it. That is, the freedom to do with your life and your body whatever it is you see fit. There was nothing particularly intense or stressful about that day. The capital H heaviness that had afflicted me since adolescence was no more or less oppressive than usual. Contrary to popular understanding of how suicide works, this moment was not one of profound emotional distress. Rather, it was a moment notable only for its mundanity, for its having no emotional weight whatsoever. I've had similar experiences maybe two dozen times since then, on bridges, on subway platforms, once in, an apartment, once in an apartment I was subletting for the summer on 57th Street in Chicago, the sweet and sour tang of the noodle shop downstairs wafting in through the windows. Sometimes the thought evaporates as quickly as it appears. Sometimes the thought lingers, infecting everything with a kind of myopic fatalism. Space-time flattens and compresses. This moment right now becomes every moment, and I stop being able to imagine a time when being alive had ever felt any different. Every feeling and every sensation is put under a microscope, and I watch attentively, helplessly, for a sign of my own imminent destruction. I started taking SSRIs after I graduated from college, and while they have helped to temper the emotional zeniths and nadirs that have for a long time have made my life so unpredictable, the heaviness seems to persist unfazed. As I've gotten older, these moments of terrible freedom have only increased in frequency and severity. They stick around for longer and longer, and they become more and more specific. A few months ago, I became so terrified of knives that I couldn't even bear to look at one. Tucked away in their drawer, they seemed to bend the air around them and pull me toward them with an ugly gravity. The heaviness, it seems, has no interest in the vicissitudes of human emotion, joy, sadness, pain, or ecstasy. It subsists on something else, something hidden in the vast and confounding soup of my brain chemistry. And this is the scariest thing about living with depression. It is not the fear of death, which, in my experience at least, is relatively easy to manage, since it is a, fe it is a fear shared by nearly every human being on Earth to some degree. What is worse is the fear that this thing, this feeling, is a fundamental part of me, permanent and inextricable no matter how I choose to define myself like an arm, or a leg, or kidney.